can get started. Hey, hey, Greg, can you um, put your line on mute? I think we're getting a little uh, feedback. Uh, how do I do that? There you go. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining um, today's installment of the Wednesday webinar series. Today, our topic is RAD and Section 18 blends. Uh, my name is Kayla Prendergast, and I'm one of your hosts today, along with Chad Ruppel, Jane Hornstein, and Will Laddie, Levy from HUD. Uh, before I pass it over to Chad to get us started, I have a few housekeeping items that I want to go over. If you've um, joined one of these webinars in the past, it's a similar situation, um, but if you haven't, I just want to quickly go over this um, so that you know how to ask questions. So the first way that you can ask questions is in the right-hand navigation panel. You'll see the hand-shaped icon. You can raise your hand and we'll unmute your line, and you can ask questions in that way. Or if you don't have microphone capabilities or, you know, just aren't comfortable um, sharing your question out loud, you can type your question in the chat box and I will read it out to our panelists. Um, everyone is muted upon entry, as I'm sure you've noticed. And if you have any technical difficulties or questions throughout, uh, just send us a message in the chat box. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on HUD Exchange shortly following the webinar. Immediately following the webinar, there'll be sort of a pop-up on your screen. It usually goes into like a little tab on whatever browser you're using um, just with just a short survey on the webinar. Um, as you know, we're doing a few of these and we're always looking for feedback um, to improve. So just take a second and fill that out for us if you can. And with that, I'll pass it over to Chad. Thanks, Kayla. Um... So as, as Kayla mentioned, we have two really main presenters here. We have Jane Hornstein from the Special Application Center and Will Levy from the Office of Recapitalization. Um, I'll be turning it over to them shortly. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction. So many of you have probably participated on these webinar series in the past. Um, we have a whole bunch of them planned and some of them that have already happened. Uh, today's focus is really, really a, a deep dive into RAD and Section 18 blends. Um, <clears throat> we're going to cover a number of things, uh, obviously describe what a RAD Section 18 blend is, um, why PHAs might want to utilize a blend, uh, talk about some of the pros and cons. We'll give you examples of the different blends, um, explain how to apply, and then as with all these calls, we'll leave a lot of time at the end for any questions or um, considerations, uh, comments you may have. So as I mentioned, this is one of a series of these um, Wednesday webinars. Um, each one is really designed to focus on a specific topic that we know PHAs or, you know, industry um, uh, experts have had questions with regarding repositioning. Um, if you missed our earlier discussions, don't worry. Uh, they're all recorded and available on HUD Exchange. And if any of these other discussions coming up look interesting, please go to HUD Exchange and uh, register. Uh, we have, I think, some great topics coming up, and there's actually another topic we're planning to add at the bottom there to focus on uh, PVV issues. So, you know, we're hoping that this is something that continues to be useful for everybody. And I would also add, at the end of this discussion, there's going to be a survey, and if you would like another topic or if there's something else that's really, uh, you know, you're wondering about that you would like us to focus in on, please make sure to note that in your survey, and we will uh, add it to the schedule. Also, um, if you haven't seen some of our additional resources, uh, please go check it out. We have a uh, HUD repositioning website. Uh, there's a growing list of handouts there. There's recordings that are available there. We, in particular, have a uh, introduction to repositioning webinar series that you can record. It's a four-session series or watch that's uh, recorded and available. It's four sessions. And um, if you would actually like to see a live version of this webinar series, uh, registration spots are still available. Um, we are having it starting the first week of August. It will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the first two weeks, uh, four sessions. Um, like I said, there's slots available, so if you uh, haven't had a chance yet to just get the full introduction to repositioning uh, training experience, uh, please go check it out. It's open to uh, PHAs, uh, board members, anyone who's working with PHAs on repositioning. And um, I think uh, you'll find, hopefully, it's a very useful tool. And it will provide a lot more of the foundational knowledge uh, that we don't really cover in these uh, individual webinars. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jane to really dive into the presentation today. Thank you, Chad. Um, OK. Oh, am I? Do I need to turn to do this? 
so. Yes, Jane, you have the presenter, so you can just move through the slides. Okay, I don't, I don't know how to do this. Oh, that's okay. It's so just the um, the little arrows on the top. I can do it if, if that's easier. There it is. Okay, got it. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you, Kayla. Um, so we've got. So we're going to talk about uh, RAD Section 18 blends. And at the moment, we have two types of blends that we're going to talk about today. Um, the first one being um, the 75-25% blend. That's what we call it. Um, this type of blend was outlined in PAH Notice 2018-04. And what it does is it allows the housing authority to reposition up to 75% of their um, a, a specific project as RAD and 25% as Section 18, just automatically. So it's, it's a very simplified um, Section 18 application. You don't have to do up what, um, but it does involve substantial construction or rehabilitation, and you cannot use the 9% credit uh, with this, the 9% loan compassion cash credit. The other type of blend that we're looking at is the RAD Section 8 closeout blend. And this is if you're down to your last unit, you've repositioned um, most of your other units and you have, you know, 75 or 100 left and you're wanting to, to go ahead and just close those out. Um, in this situation, you can pick, um, if you have over 50, you can get up to 50 units as public housing and the other um, the remainder can be RAD. If you have less than 50 units, but you still want to do the blend, and there's good reasons to consider that, which is what we'll talk about today, then you can look at doing, you know, let's say you have 30 units, you might want to do four units of RAD and 26 units of, of Section 18. So there's lots of ways to mix and match with that one. Um, and again, in both of these situations, under the Section 18, you are not required to do the, the obsolescence test, um, which is for Section 18. These are, by, you know, we're not, we, that's not what we're looking at for these. Um, the benefits of the blend um, is it allows you to, uh, there's a lot more flexibility in the use of public housing funds towards repositioning. So, uh, this is one of the few tools in which if you have reserves, you should seriously look at a blend because you can bring your public housing funds into a new development as part of the RAD budget. Um, you cannot do that with Section 18. And you can't do it with streamlined voluntary conversions. But under the RAD blends, you can. Um, it, it, what it does is it allows you to get a higher overall income with those Section 18 units at the higher rent, rent level. And that's not going to be true on all the public housing authorities, but for the vast majority, your voucher rents are going to be higher than your what you're currently getting under public housing subsidies. So this is a way to increase your cash flow uh, pretty simply. Um, in addition, uh, residents' rights. So all the resident rights that are, are allowed under RAD, um, which is the rights to return to the property after any renovations, um, the right to tenant participation funding, and the right to tenant grievance procedures, all of that applies across the board. In Section 18, they go directly from public housing into the voucher program. This gives that transition time and also gives them some rights. Over income families have a right to have their incomes adjusted over time. That's all accounted for with the RAD units and those protections go to all households now. Um, in addition, uh, with these, there's a streamlined application process through RAD. It's a very simple process and, and We'll, we'll talk more about that in the next few slides. Um, so at this point, I guess I can turn it over to Will. 
Maybe. Okay. <clears throat> so we think uh, made you the presenter. You should be good to go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide. Um, we'll dive a little bit deeper into each of the blend types. Uh, could you um, look over to the slide nine, please? Or am I oh, able? Yeah, to? so I have. Oh, I can yeah, do that. You're able to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so, so let's go a little bit deeper into each of the two blend types. So, so first of all, the 75, we call it 7525 blend. This is specifically discussed in PH Notice 2018-04, which is uh, should be a, the a tabletop notice you keep at your side to understand how things can be approved under Section 18 and under what justifications. One of the justifications that was added to this notice was um, uh, uh, <clears throat> permission that when there's a RAD conversion that involves new construction or substantial rehab without the use of 9% tax credits, and HUD will approve 25% of the units through Section 18. And those units uh, would then, uh, uh, PHA would be issued um, kind of protection voucher funding, and those vouchers would be project-based at the site, uh, resulting in a site that's 75% converting through RAD and 25% and, uh, uh, going through Section 18 and, and resulting in a project-based voucher contract that way. Um, so I said just a couple of notes uh, noted that it qualifies for new constructed, the property needs to be newly constructed or substantially rehabilitated. We've defined substantial rehab as um, having a rad scope of work for the hard construction costs, including general requirements, overhead and profit, payment and performance bonds, exceeds 60% of the HUD published housing construction costs for a given market area. So this is not the same way at, at the SAC might look at um, a PHA's justification under the obsolescence standard under Section 18, where there are strict definitions of what kind of work can be ex included or excluded. Um, under this, it's, uh, it's just based on the work that is proposed in the conversion. Um, as long as it meets the standard, uh, the, the property could qualify. We've created a workbook that's available on the RAD resource desk where a PHA can test uh, whether or not uh, but after filling in information about their, their area and the unit types that they're constructing um, and, and the proposed cost, they can test whether or not they, they, they meet this threshold. Uh, so how does this help? So in the very simple way, the, the very often the regular project-based voucher rents are higher than the RAD rents. Not always, but, but, in, but in most cases they are. Um, so if you take, for example, a 100-unit property with RAD rents of $800 per unit per month, um, uh, the standard PVB rents in that market, let's say, are $1,200. So if you blend these two with 75% RAD and 25% uh, Section 18 that then, result, that then end up in a regular project-based voucher contract, the blended rents uh, uh, come out to $900 per unit. And that additional uh, revenue is enough to, to leverage an additional 20000 per unit in debt financing alone, um, and, and possibly more depending on interest rates. Uh, so that's a really significant bump in, in the, uh, the, the, the juice that's in the property to, 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 leverage, um, to leverage financing. So our hope here is to really be able to facilitate more of these um, more of these transactions um, by, by providing this uh, or enabling this uh, increase in revenue. Uh, as an example, here is one of our first blends, um, a property called Sooner Haven in Oklahoma City. It's 150 units um, where through the blend, 113 units converted through RAD, project-based voucher contract, and 37 units were removed through Section 18 and placed under a non-RAD project-based voucher contract. Um, the higher revenue uh, enabled the Housing Authority to raise an additional $2 million in debt. And in total, they were able to do sub-rehab uh, totaling uh, $94,000 per unit in, in construction costs. Okay, I'll transition now to their closeout plan. So uh, the same PAH notice that I referred to, 2018-04, allows a PHA to dispose of its remaining public housing units through Section 18 if the PHA has 50 or fewer units. 
um, as long as the PHA commits to closing out its public housing program. Uh, so again, the, the, the property doesn't need to meet any other Section 18 standard. The PHA doesn't have to show that the property is obsolete. Um, it just has to have 50 or fewer units. Um, we have been working, RECAP and the Special Application Center has been working together to figure out how to blend that combination, that 50 or fewer units um, uh, provision with RAD. Um, uh, uh, so we do allow PHAs to combine it with RAD to include all of the PHAs remaining public housing units. So the conversion can be more or less than 50, but it must include all of the remaining units. Let me see if this is... Um, so, uh, in other words, the, the, if a PHA has 80 units, uh, 30 of the units can convert through RAD, and 50 of the units could would convert through Section 18. Similarly, if the PHA had 40 units, uh, 4 zero, uh, it could convert 10 units through RAD and 30 units through Section 18. So there's a few different options there. So why would you do this? Um, so uh, for one thing, if a PHA has more than 50 units, it's probably trying to, uh, but, but it's still relatively small, it's, it's trying to figure out what to do with all of its stock. And so this is a nice way of combining the benefits of the higher rents uh, for the last 50 units with RAD. Um, uh, and you get all the same benefits that, we, that, that Jane talked about earlier. Uh, RAD provides some funding flexibility. The PHA can bring over, uh, contribute into the conversion into the property, its remaining public housing funds. Um, obviously, as I said, this can increase the rents at the, at the property. Um, the RAD resident rights, which include things like the prohibition against rescreening and right of return, and certain protections around increases in rents, um, those all apply. Um, so the Housing Authority can commit and promise to residents a robust set of protections. Uh, okay, so here's an example of a closeout blend. Bear with me for a second. So after taking two other properties through Section 18, one that met obsolescence and other that were some other scatter site units. The Housing Authority of Butte had 131 units remaining across three properties. So it had 131 units and it says, all right, what, what do I do with these? They knew the units needed work um, uh, uh, and, and wanted to figure out how to reposition the rest of its stock, but couldn't do it with RAD alone. So it utilized the RAD Section 18 closeout line to convert 96 of the units, which are in two properties, in, with the, in, uh, through RAD. And 35 units that was in another property through Section 18. The properties were combined under a single tax credit transaction to support the substantial rehab of all 131 units. That was that wasn't required. It just so happens that these or that wasn't that's not a, a requirement of the closeout blend per se. Um, uh, uh, if the properties were in great condition, they would not have had to do the substantial rehab. But they did because of the units converting through RAD. They did a capital needs assessment on the overall stock knew that it, um, it that, that they needed work and so pursued a tax credit transaction. Uh, in the process, by the way, the Housing Authority was able to trade in all of its future projected DDTF from Section 18 actions. So this Housing Authority was going out of business, or not, I shouldn't say going out of business, this Housing Authority was ending its public housing program, transitioning over to, to, to Section 8, um, uh, and had a number of these Section 18 actions that were producing what they call demolition disposition transition funding, which provide um, uh, capital funds for, uh, for five years after the demolition or disposition action. Um, RAD allows the DDTF to be captured in the transaction to, 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 in, to uh, that future DDTF to be incorporated into the RAD rent. So they are also able to end up with higher RAD rents, again, um, uh, facilitating the, 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 the rehab of the property. Um, and the PHA was able to contribute $300,000 in public housing capital funds to, to fill an additional gap. Um, so that's a nice example of a PHA using the blend to really uh, um, meet a core community need um, and, and, and significantly improve these properties. You might be saying, well, this sounds great, Will, but that sounds like a nightmare having to navigate both the RAD process and the Section 18 process, working with two offices, 
um, and hoping that they uh, operate in parallel and are coordinated and work out of the end. Well, the good news is we've made it as easy as we possibly could. We've, uh, uh, what a, uh, the Office of Recapitalization is your primary point of contact when you utilize the blend because we are treating it overall as a RAD transaction, including all of our underwriting uh, standards, many of which are, uh, are, are similar to some of the Section 18 requirements. For example, an environmental review. There's no need to do two environmental reviews. We do one, um, and that will count for, for, for both programs. Um, so uh, you start off by submitting an application for RAD for the entire property, or in, under either of these blends, by the way. Um, uh, uh, the application is processed like any other RAD application through the RAD resource desk. Usually it takes um, uh, about 30 to 60 days to approve the application. Uh, it requires board approval, resident meetings. Uh, we've got a training on the resource desk on how to complete the application. Uh, after the application, the PHA works with the transaction manager to, uh, or the, the, the PHA works through the uh, requirements of converting the property through RAD, so develops, completes the capital needs assessment, um, uh, uh, develops a financing plan, submits that to us, uh, and we will then revise the CHAP to exclude the units if it qualifies under the Section 18 blend, RAD, uh, RAD Section 18 blend. We'll, we'll modify the CHAP award to, to remove the units that are going to go through Section 18. Um, in the financing plan, the PHA is giving us all the standard things they, it, it gives um, HUD or any other RAD conversion, plus we've itemized on some FAQs the uh, five or six additional things that are needed um, in order to also satisfy Section 18 requirements. But you, you submit them all to one place um, on the RAD resource desk. So you don't have to go into two different systems. Um, we work internally with the SAC. We give them the documents they need. They create the tick removal application. They let us know if anything's missing or anything's uh, deficient, and, and we coordinate jointly with the housing authority. Um, and when it's all approvable, uh, when we're ready to approve the financing plan, we issue our RAD conversion commitment and the SAC simultaneously or within a day or two issues the Section 18 approval letter. It's all coordinated, um, and the PHA doesn't have to worry about um, kind of having to coordinate with two different offices. Um, the closing of the RAD conversion and the Section 18 disposition occurs simultaneously with the PHA um, entering into the RAD HAP contract for the RAD units and to under a TBV HAP or sometimes uh, as, as necessary uh, an agreement to enter into a HAP contract if the property is newly constructed or substantially rehab or requires some rehab. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, so the HAP contract settled, the units are removed from PIC, um, and we uh, record a RAD use agreement generally on, on the entire property. So uh, let's back a little higher level. Four takeaways here. We got two types of blends, blends the 7525 blend and the closeout blend. If you have a project that needs moderate rehab or more, and you don't have 9% tax credits, consider the 7525 blend. Run those numbers to see if, uh, if, 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 if that gets you there to be able to, to support the rehab the property needs by blending in some um, regular project-based vouchers. If you're planning to close out your public housing program and you want to carry over public housing funds um, or you've got over 50 units and all, all that, consider a closeout blend. Um, and then on the processing perspective, all blends start with a RAD application. Um, and uh, uh, we, we maintain, we try to maintain a single point of contact with the PHA to make it as easy as possible. We're starting to wrap up here, so, so start to think of what your questions are going to be. Um, uh, a few more details. Other ways the RAD and Section 18 can work together. Uh, I've mentioned this in the Butte example, but PHAs can use DDTF from earlier Section 18 removals to increase the RAD rents. Those PHAs are thinking about uh, repositioning larger portfolios. One thing you should think about is if they're some, one of the early steps is a Section 18 action. 
say, the disposition of scattered sites or something like that, that will, once completed, that will trigger DDTF, and those, that, that uh, amounts HUD will project uh, what that amount will be and can uh, allow housing authority to trade that in um, for, for higher RAD rents. Um, uh, also, PJs can use proceeds from an earlier Section 18 disposition toward a RAD conversion. So I'll use the same example. If, if uh, PHA is thinking about repositioning its whole portfolio and uh, uh, its first step is to dispose of some scattered sites, it should be thinking about, well, the proceeds that it earns from those scattered sites, how, where can those best be deployed elsewhere in the portfolio, maybe as part of a RAD conversion or, or some other action. Um, uh, so those are just a couple of other um, uh, considerations. We've got more on the, this kind of information on, on a different uh, uh, webinar, one of the earlier ones uh, that's posted now on the, re on the repositioning uh, website called Developing a Repositioning Strategy. Still want more? So we've got two really solid FAQs on this topic, on both topics, on the 75-25 blend and the closeout blend that covers in more detail eligibility, um, uh, uh, some of the rules around the, that, uh, uh, around the project-based voucher program that you might not be thinking about, um, uh, and, and processing uh, requirements. Um, uh, so, so please check those out if, if, if um, either of these have piqued your interest. Both are available on the RAD Resource Desk and on uh, the HUD's, HUD's repositioning webpage. You can also, of course, uh, and should also, of course, contact your local public housing field office to talk about these options. Um, they can uh, they can answer your questions best they can. They can also connect you with other folks at HUD who, if if they are unable to answer your question, and you can email repositioning at HUD.com. Okay, I think we are ready to turn to questions from the audience. Um, I think folks are All right. We've had um, a bunch come in while you were talking, Will, so I'll just go ahead and get right to it. Great. Um, first question, what is the benefit of a housing authority disposing of 25% of the unit? Sure. So the, the disposition, uh, thank you for, uh, for asking this question, the, um, the disposition, you can view disposition in two ways. One is a true arm's length uh, disposition where you're selling off a property for fair market value and you're not going to use it for affordable housing anymore. It's really not what we're talking about um, in, the, in this context. Typically what's happening in this context is the disposition is to an instrumentality of the PHA or a, the nonprofit affiliate of the PHA or maybe the tax credit partnership that is uh, the, the three developing. So, the, the overall, if you've got a 100-unit property that's going through a blend, um, and let's say it's a tax credit transaction, all 100 units are, are going to be on the ground. What's happening is all 100 units are being sold into the tax credit partnership, both units that are converting through RAD and those that are going through Section 18. And that's technically a disposition. That's a Section 18 disposition. Um, it's not selling off the property and walking away from it. This is it's really reinvesting. Um, in the property. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Jane might be able to provide some more detail, but, but a disposition can, can just be a, a, really any conveyance of the property to, to, uh, to another entity um, and, and, and can be for a preservation purpose. Right. So, they, they, and keep in mind if they do it, it would be there's two HAP contracts. There would be the first through. Um, to RAD, and then the second would be for the units to go Section 18, and they would have a separate HAP contract. But, it, but you can project base, and actually you must project base those units as part of the blend. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't be a, a straight out disposition. It would be, a, it, it's into this project, to the new project. Right, yeah, the, the HUD's expectation here, these, these are all being done as part of a preservation action, um, preservation and improvement. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the units that go through Section 18 are to be project-based, will, will end up under a project-based voucher contract. I, I received one question, by the way, um, 
Bill, I'm not sure if you, if you see this, but it's somewhat related, which is um, uh, to, to what I last said, um, is whether the units that go through Section 18 can only go to a project-based voucher contract. Um, and that is currently the case. Um, uh, because of the way it works, Section 18 triggers the issuance of tenant protection vouchers. Um, those vouchers get issued to a housing agency um, and uh, can then be project-based under uh, 24 CFR 983. Um, we've heard from a number of agencies, either those that um, don't have a voucher program and have generally been pursuing project-based rental assistance, which is a contract directly with HUD um, in their RAD conversions, um, or some that have a, have a voucher program, but through all their RAD conversions are doing TBRA conversions. Um, and they, they want to take advantage of the blend, but would love to be able to get those, those, um, those units to a PBRA contract. HUD, HUD did propose this in um, an appropriation bill in the FY21, uh, the, the um, housing appropriation bill, which would be um, the, the, the bill that would be in effect um, as soon as October. Um, so it's something that Congress is considering whether or not to allow those um, those vouchers to be turned into uh, a, a PBRA contract. Uh, but we don't currently have that authority and, and we don't know what, uh, what direction Congress will take with that. All right, Kayla, back to you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, next question. Um, so all 50 must be in one conversion and not two separate conversions? All 50 must be in one conversion. So the, uh, if we're talking about the closeout blend, um, uh, is the question, uh, is the, should we view this all as a single transaction or a single, uh, uh, yeah, a, a single transaction, or can they be uh, split into two? Um, so I uh, believe we require that the, um, that it all be a single transaction, that if it's uh, a 60 unit property, uh, that we are viewing all 60 units and reviewing all 60 units together as a whole um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and processing that as a single transaction. If it's 60 units, but it's uh, actually in two different properties, 30 units here and 30 units there, um, uh, uh, we'll, Assuming those units, those two properties, can still be considered a project, that they're, they're really managed together as, as one um, uh, single entity, uh, uh, we, that would be processed together as a single transaction um, and, and not split apart. If that, answer, if, if that doesn't answer the question, if, if whoever asked it might maybe um, uh, unmutes their phone or, or maybe submits a follow-up question, whatever is most helpful. Shannon, does that answer your question? Um, hey, Will, yeah, it's Shannon. Um, yeah, so in the scenario, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, hey, Shannon. Yeah. Okay, hey. Um, so in the scenario that you presented, I forget how many total units there were in the property, uh, but 96, there were three properties, 96 went as RAD, I don't know, 35 right. went as Section 18. So I was just thinking, it comes up pretty regularly that there's smaller housing authorities and they have a property that has maybe 12 units. Um, and so you hate for the rest of the units <laughs> that you couldn't capture, what is it, 38 of the last 50, even though they're closing out in a previous RAD transaction. So, so I was just trying to think of a way where you could capture all 50, but not necessarily in the same conversion, but that but th they are exiting public housing. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, would, you mind, would you mind stating the scenario again? Okay. So, yeah. All right. So a housing authority has, um, they're going to go section 18, they want to use the last 50 
well, actually, this is probably more relevant to, to a different situation. Um, but I was just thinking a, a public housing authority wanted to go with the last 50 units. Um, could they split the last 50, or even as a closeout plan, could they split the last 50 between two different transactions if they closed at the same time? Um, I think we uh, generally require that it all be done as a single transaction. Okay, that's, yeah, I was just trying not to yeah. waste but if the 32 if, units. <laughs> but, but Shannon, I, there might be other considerations of what you're saying, so if you want to follow up separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, so for the Butte example, why not maximize the 50 units at Section 18 to get the highest rent? Why did they only do 35 for Section 18 in the remaining RAD? I think this is related. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so uh, indeed, yeah, they, they could have done, they, what, they, what they did was they did um, individual, I believe they were individual three buildings. Let's just, let's just say they were buildings. Um, and for administrative ease, I think they, because they're going to be different contracts, they chose to have uh, 36 units um, under a regular PVV contract and the two other buildings to be under RAD contracts. They potentially could have gone, um, uh, uh, could have taken a few more units through Section 18 is the question of notes, but I think they, 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 they chose not to for administrative reasons. Like the, the the difference in rents was not so great to um, to, 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 to 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 sway them to do that. Okay. Next question: How do you project the amount of DDTF? Uh, so we work with the capital fund office um, to do so. Uh, there's, you know, if a PHA wants a back of the envelope approach, they can look up um, the capital fund posts for every public housing development, how much each development generated towards the PHA's overall capital fund. Um, and DDTF is really, it follows the same formula. So if, uh, if uh, a property generated $200,000 uh, this year for the capital fund, if it's removed through section 18 and, uh, and, and DDTF is triggered, it'll get $200,000 the next year, depending on appropriations, of course. Um, what we ask uh, PJs to do is to tell us they are interested in doing this. We have um, a uh, rent adjustment, uh, RAD rent adjustment guide and, uh, that, that talks about the process here. But you, you approach HUD, you ask, you say you're interested in doing this, you want to get an estimate of the rents. We coordinate with the capital fund office so that they um, uh, kind of sign off on, on the amount. Uh, we report that back to you, and if you want to trade it in, we give you a little certification form saying, yes, I'd like to increase my RAD rents, and I would, uh, I agree that I will, um, I will reject the, 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 the future DDTF. Okay, thanks, Liz. Next question. How do you project the financial after RAD pro forma as compared to current public housing model? Uh, so in um, every every RAD team blend um, is underwritten by the Office of Recap. Um, the underwriting standards are defined in Attachment 1A of the RAD notice. Uh, so we require an operating pro forma that uh, uh, projects out 20 years, showing revenue and expenses. Um, uh, we uh, um, uh, expect that any reductions in operating expenses uh, below what how the property is operating today um, are, are are justified. The PHA provides justification of de decreases, oftentimes you know energy efficiency improvements or uh, uh, transitions in management models or other other reasons. Um, uh, 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 the operating expenses might decrease. Um, uh, so uh, you, 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 can, you can look at uh, again attachment 1A of the RAD uh, of the RAD notice to, to see um, how, how, how we are looking at um, both revenue and expenses 
um, in underwriting the conversion. Okay, thanks. I'll head over to the next question. Are separate chats required for each public housing project? Uh, so separate chaps are required for each transaction or each conversion. Um, sometimes PHAs are able to combine properties from uh, multiple AMPs if they um, have a good justification for why that is uh, reasonably considered a project, uh, why, how it can meet the standard of a single manageable and marketable entity. Um, uh, most of the time, transactions that we see come through RAD are an AMP or are actually a part of an AMP that, um, uh, and where, where the PHA long-term is actually going to, um, or its partners are going to operate the property as a, um, uh, or operate the project as a, a subset of, of what, how the AMP is currently structured. If you have questions about the aggregation of properties towards a, uh, into, a, into a project or a transaction, uh, please, please contact us. We, we love to have that conversation as early as possible, so PHAs don't don't go down a road where they or, or uh, under one assumption um, and have that potentially um, potentially unwind that. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question: Does a closeout blend require a limit or cap on units that can be Section 18? For example, if 50 units are remaining, can 49 be converted under Section 18? So, um, in other words, if you've got a 60-unit property, could you take, oh, not 10 units through RAD and 50 units through Section 18, but 11 units through RAD and 49 units through Section 18? Um, I don't see a problem with that. Jane, do you, do you, do you see any issue with that? No, That's not at all. Good scenario, right? Yep. Yeah, I'll get into that. Okay, next question. A related question that was that was um, uh, looks like it was just sent to me, but I'll just I'll, I'll say that loud for everyone's benefit, which is okay. that in the in the closeout blend, if you've got 70 units um, and they're going to take 50 through Section 18 and 20 through RAD, um, does uh, can, does the PHA have the discretion to choose which of the units go through Section 18 and which of the units go through RAD? And could they take the three and the four bedroom units through Section 18 and two bedroom units through through RAD? Um, and again, that's I think it's up to the uh, to, to the PHA to, to, to units um, ultimately get moved under which um, under which approach. Sorry, Kayla, back to you. Thanks. So for long-term planning, since RAD rents are lower than PBV, how long are the DDTF funds available to increase RAD rents? So um, the, uh, the DDTF, uh, some people think of it like DDTF is you know, like the property is getting a separate stream of funds. What we actually do is we, you, you do not get the DDTF through the capital fund. And instead, you get higher RAD rents. So all the funding is incorporated into the Section 8 HAP contract that's signed at closing. In there, as, as in the, in the 20, um, it's not a dollar for dollar increase. Of course, five years of DDTF, we've been amortized that out over 20 years of a HAP contract. So, um, uh, uh, you know, what, if you trade in a dollar of DDTF, that doesn't turn into a dollar of increased rent. Uh, uh, but uh, the uh, but, but it's it, but it's captured over the, over the twenty year period. Okay, next question. So the housing authority is required to close out of public housing. Would it continue to get R for DDTF for the units that closed out at Section 18? If yes, what would you do with those funds, or do they stop at closing? So the only way they would be eligible for those funds is if, in fact, they have a use for them. So if you don't have a use for them, then no, you don't get them. And they have to be used on public housing. So, I mean, they can be used for things like an accountant to close out your book. But other than that, yeah. if you don't have any public housing left, then you're done. And you can't take them. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. So is this process any different if you have a BNI grant? Uh, no, the, uh, I, can't, I can't think of any difference um, if, if the authority is also using a choice neighborhood implementation grant. Uh, and indeed, there, there's a bonus, which is, uh, at least in the Office of Recapitalization, uh, the, the same person who does our RAD conversions for, um, uh, that, that, are, that also involve choice neighborhoods grants, also is deeply familiar with the RAD Section 18 plans, um, uh, and so you're, you're in great hands. Okay, thanks. So on the blend protection slide, it said that overhoused can stay under PBV, but a typical Section 18 conversion, but in a typical Section 18 conversion, overhoused have to move to meet the PBV standards. Is that correct? Uh, right, so whenever, one of the things that we've described in the RAD notice is that whenever RAD and regular project-based vouchers are combined in, a, in the same project, that the RAD rights um, extend to, 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 to residents of the, the PVB properties, uh, the PVB units as well. Um, one of those protections, uh, the overriding, most important protection is a prohibition against Screening. So um, even though families are technically being admitted into the Section 8 program, they can't be rescreened. Um, they, they, they're, they're grandfathered in. Um, uh, more specifically, the question was about the protection for overhouse families. Um, uh, the, the requirement under that is that the family can remain overhouse, but to be it, it must be moved to an appropriately sized unit if one is available in the project. It's not a, um, it's not a, uh, 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 an allowance for the family to remain overhoused forever um, if, if, they're a, if they're in a three-bedroom unit, but they're more appropriately housed in a, in a two-bedroom unit. When one frees up at the property, it's expected that they would be moved into the, into the two-bedroom unit. Question. Uh, so we've touched on this a little bit, but I just want to make sure that we capture everybody's questions. Um, can you explain a little bit more on the DDTF topic? How does that work on a Section 18 removal? Does that Section 18 removal need to be demolition, or what would happen to the tenant? Uh, so in uh, in the context of RAD Section 18 blends, the Section 18 approval, um, I believe, Jane, is always a disposition approval. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so, so you don't need to secure demolition approval. Thank you, Jane, for confirming. Uh, it's, a, it's a disposition approval, um, and uh, 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 so that, that might be one part of the question. Another part of the question was um, what triggers DDTF? Is, is demolition or disposition? I think the answer is both, that, 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 that either a demolition or a disposition approval under Section 18 triggers DVTF. So that could be, uh, you know, the disposition of scattered sites that a PHA is doing today, or it could be uh, the demolition and, and disposition of a, a obsolete property that the PHA did two or three years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Either of those actions would, would have triggered uh, a DVTF. Right, because it's they're basically an extension of your capital fund for a five-year period um, after the demolition or disposition to help reposition whatever else is going in. But it has to be you know, for capital fund purposes. It it stays with public housing. So if you're transitioning out of the public housing program and there's no use for it, then you can't take it. But if you have a use for it within your, you know, within your portfolio, then you can use that, you can use that. So if you have them for another, you know, if you've already done one, let's say you have an obsolete building that you've got Section 18 for, you would get BDTF for that. And that could go into another building that you're doing RAD on.
as part of the okay, blend. Thanks. So we have someone with a question raised, so I'm going to unmute your line, Mr. Schiff. Hi, Mr. Schiff, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, you had a question icon. Um, did you want to ask your question out loud? Sure. My question basically was, if we do a, if we have 100 units, we want to do a 75-25 split, as I understand what Jane said earlier, we have to, we're going to end up with two half contracts. If that's the case, can we, um, wait a minute, can we do the 75% as a uh, PBRA project and the 25% is PBV because that's all we can do at this time? Yes, the, the, the RAD conversion, the units converting to RAD could go to either PBV or to PBRA. Uh, but uh, as you know, the units that go to Section 18 could, could only re result in a PBV contract. How would that complicate operations of the project? Uh, so uh, it's a good question. Um, we have had a few cases where PHAs have done that, and um, it would be good for us to, to do some follow-up with those housing authorities about their experience. We've heard of a few smaller issues, risk management and things like that, uh, but uh, essentially uh, there are lots of properties in the country that have multiple forms of assistance on different units. and. Um, at least at the unit level and family level, the PHA and owner would be operating the, 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 those units and, and uh, treating those families in accordance with each of the program's requirements. So indeed, it's, it's definitely more complicated, um, which is one of the reasons we've asked Congress to um, allow that to be, to be streamlined somewhat. I guess my question, Will, is what are the differences in the programs from a resident perspective, I, you know, they pay the same rent, right? 30% of adjusted income. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the same resident rights because it's the rad right to go with it. How does it complicate operations? Uh, I see. Um, so subsidy administration is different, right? So how the, uh, so, so there's uh, two perspectives, right? From the, from the resident's perspective, um, uh, the biggest difference I can think of is the, the choice mobility requirement, where the PBRA units have a right to about right. one year, two years, uh -huh. um, and under PBB and after one year. Um, I'll try to think if there if there are any others, but that's the biggest one that stands out at me. It's probably more from the owner's perspective of having to handle uh, manage different requirements. Um, but we can think a little bit more about that and see if we can put together a, 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 um, a, a, a short list. But as you say, in a lot of cases, for, for most things, you know, tenant rent calculations and the RAD resident rights um, and uh, uh, the, the forms of lease can be there, they can be um, made almost identical. Um, uh, so while they might be separate forms, um, uh, the, the provisions of the leases can be made to, 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 to be virtually identical. Right. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's, worth, it's worth, uh, worth us thinking through a little bit more if there are any other um, uh, uh, notable differences from a, from a resident's perspective. One last thing. I've, I've been around longer than I want to think about. You are doing an outstanding job on trying to educate us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, next question. Under Section 18 blend, does the non contiguous requirement still apply? For the scattered site? Uh, no. That's, the non contiguous is for scattered sites, which is a different justification. If you want to do your last 50 and they're contiguous, that's fine. I don't know if that answered that okay. question. Okay, yeah, I'll have ask that person um, to you know, follow up if you want some more clarification. Um, next question, can you provide some more info on how to project-based TPVs? Uh, so, Amaris, if you're there, I appreciate your help 
to answer this question. Um, hey, Marcy, is that you un unmuting? Hi, yes, that's me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so, so in the context, to repeat the question, Mars, in the context of a, a, a PHA, uh, let's keep it simple, uh, uh, trying to project base those vouchers back on the former public housing property, um, what does that look like? Um, so so it, the question seems, seems pretty broad, um, and I can take the next hour going through the PVV <laughs> requirements. Um, what, I what I will say is that there are some resources available right now. There are some PVV FAQs and some tenant protection voucher FAQs. I think it was part of the presentation that you can take a look at that gives a, a lot of very helpful information. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Shad um, announced this, but there will be a project-based voucher training coming up in December. So I think we can kind of um, go through it there with more detail. But I, if, if whoever asks the question uh, wants to reach out to me, then we can, we can go through it. But uh, for now, I would say look at those FAQs, and that should put things in perspective. I'll, I'll just add thanks to Marcel. Indeed, there's a lot of lot of information to to digest there. Uh, just some uh, observations from uh, from the recap side. One, it's doable. It's it's not a, a, a it's, it's not a, a very uh, challenging process. Uh, but two, we know a lot of housing authorities haven't done it before. Um, uh, and we've we've observed uh, some mistakes made, and we've, we've, we've worked with housing authorities to correct them. So please, if you've not uh, done it before, take the time to use the resources Maris is talking about the FAQs and the forthcoming training um, to 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 really get up to speed. And I would also add, so we don't um, we don't reference the uh, FAQs in this PowerPoint, but we have in some of our other ones, and you can find them from the same repositioning website that we do reference here. So you know, I was talking earlier, we have this nice repositioning website with a number of resources all in one spot, and so you should be able to find the, both the tenant protection voucher FAQs and the project-based voucher FAQs there. Okay, thanks. Next question, uh, does the Housing Authority receive additional budget authority along with the Section 18 PBB award? They get, wait, say that again, additional? Uh, budget authority? Yeah, so. Uh, yes, they just get the CPB award, right. Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the TPV award adds new vouchers to the PHA's voucher ACC and funding. Um, they get the, the unit increments and new funding to, to cover the cost of, uh, of, of, the, of the new voucher. Okay, great. Next question. Can you explain? Explain a little bit more about the process for converting PPVs to PPVs. I, I think we may have covered that question already. Mm -hmm. Okay, just didn't know if there was anything else to add. Um, what is the process, or can you explain more how the DDTF helps the Housing Authority to increase RAD rent? Uh, sure. So on the Red Resource Desk, if, if you want to look in the details, you've got a um, uh, CHAP Amendment and Rent Adjustment Guide that talks about the various ways in which the RAD rents can be adjusted. One of those ways is by trading in DDTF, and we have a formula for that. We say if you are projected over the next five years um, to get uh, uh, $1 million in DDTF, um, then we you can choose to trade that $1 million in, uh, $1 million you're going to get over the course of five years, um, and instead increase your RAD rents by following relatively simple equation, $1 million divided by 20 divided by the number of units that, that are converting through RAD. Um, uh, 
Uh, so uh, that amount is how the RAD rents increase, and then the PHA would not receive the DDTF through the capital fund grant in the future years, which if the PHA is closing out would be um, uh, a, a, a good use of that DDTF because they wouldn't otherwise have a, have, have a way to use it. Okay, so I have one more question in my queue. Uh, just a uh, last call to attendees for any questions that you might have. Reminder, you can um, raise your hand to ask the question out loud or type it in the chat box for me to read out loud. Um, so this last question is, will PBRA be an option for the 25% instead of PVV soon? Uh, so as I said, we've requested it in the FY21 budget. Uh, what that means is the administration has asked Congress to include it when it passes a budget um, 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 uh, by October. Uh, so we'll have to wait to see what happens in the 2021 budget. Um, it's a little uh, confusing to folks because uh, uh, that, that in a budget bill, there can also be authorizing language like this, but that's, that's how it works. Uh, we don't, I think it's very likely we don't have a budget by October um, uh, and, and there's a continuing resolution, in which case that would be, um, it would be delayed a few months before we find out. Um, and then once that is, um, and if it is passed, I shouldn't, shouldn't presume anything, if Congress accepts the proposal, then HUD would have to implement a provision through a, a new notice and, and some new documents. So that would take um, uh, a number of months to, to complete. Um, uh, so it's not an option now. If it were authorized, it would still take a number of months before it could be implemented and, and available to the housing authorities. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I, didn't, I don't have any more in my queue. Will any more that came directly to you? Uh, I have one question, uh, um, generally asking if you're doing sub rehab of your portfolio and uh, and you need to increase the number of handicap units um, that are uh, 504 accessible units, um, uh, if one of those units that you're turning into an accessible unit is occupied, uh, uh, do you, does the resident have a right still to return or remain in that unit? Um, or uh, is the, the PHA supposed to relocate the unit, that resident, elsewhere? Um, uh, the resident has a, a right to remain in, in the property. The right to return is a, is a right to remain in the property. So um, uh, they could be moved to a different unit at the property, but they could not be uh, um, uh, disallowed from moving back to the property. And I don't think I have okay. any. I had another come in while you were um, answering that one. Uh, so this is a scenario. Um, a housing authority has a 12-unit property left in public housing and decides to do a Section 18 disposition at fair market value under the last 50. What can they use sale proceeds on? So in, in this case, is it uh, is it uh, rad alone, or is it? Or is, I'm sorry, is this a rad Section 18 blend, or is this just? It sounds like it's just a Section 18 under 50. Uh, Shannon, can you uh, provide some clarity? Yes, it's there's no rad involved. I was just trying to sneak a question in for Jane. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we're hoping to have more guidance out in the next week or two, but um, for now, um, it can be used for the provision of low-income housing. Um, so things you can use it for any capital funds used, any operating fund used. Um, you can use them for PVV development. Um, I don't know if that... So it's not just restricted to Section 9? It can no, be used for we, Section 8? Okay. It can, as long as it's, like, creating new housing, absolutely, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. All right. So I think with that, that's all the questions that we have for today. I'll pass it over to maybe Will or Chad to close this out. I just want to quickly say, again, thanks to Will and Jane for presenting. And uh, Kayla, thank you also. And I see that you've posted uh, in the chat box the link for people to register for the upcoming web webinar. So if anyone enjoyed this and wants to uh, you know, get registered for the other upcoming uh, Wednesday webinars, the link is there in the chat box. And also uh, a link to the uh, Introduction to Repositioning Public Housing webinar that, again, is coming up in uh, just two weeks four-part series and um, really provides much more of a foundational knowledge for this repositioning type thing. So thank you, and I just encourage everyone to please, if you're interested, register, and um, another chance to learn more about repositioning. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, and remember to fill out the survey that pops up on your screen when you exit that webinar.